Thank you. Uh, can can any, everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. So uh, yeah, so you know we're all very interested by uh, the topic of uh, COVID, right? And and in my area would be related to mental health. And one of the reasons why we're all very interested is because this is something that's affecting the whole world, right? The, so this is a a stressor that that is not just affecting a, a, a little group of people, it's everybody in the world, right? Which is bad news and great news, right? Because we're not alone. So we can start by talking about something that um, uh, not too many people know about, but there's actually a field in psychiatry that is actually called disaster psychiatry. Uh, so disaster psychiatry uh, uh, works with catastrophes like uh, hurricanes, right? wars, uh, any kind of uh, event that will be considered a catastrophe for, for people or, or a particular area. Uh, there's this field, there's disaster psychiatry, and I personally would consider uh, COVID, the pandemia, as a catastrophe, right? Because of uh, how it's affecting the whole globe. So what, uh, what this field has shown is that usually when there's a catastrophe, when there's a, when there's a large event uh, that affects a lot of people, um, the main response that people are going to have are uh, depression, anxiety disorders, and with that comes also uh, substance-related disorders. From all the people affected uh, with a catastrophe or an event, uh, up a little more than a quarter of those people are going to develop symptoms of some kind of mental health problem, uh, like depression or anxiety. And about 4 to 6% of the people uh, who are affected by that event would develop PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, which is uh, uh, somebody who years later ends up developing nightmares uh, about the event, uh, flashbacks, and flashbacks will be, a lot of people feel like, uh, I believe that flashbacks are uh, um, memories of the event, but it's not memories, it's actually, you feel like the event is happening all over again, so you get the same kind of uh, response, emotional response, physical response, uh, as when you were in that in that event. Um, other symptoms of it uh, would include avoidance, uh, and avoidance would be uh, uh, trying to, uh, what it, like what the name says, uh, trying to avoid any place, person, situation uh, that would remind you of the event. And another symptom would be uh, uh, hyperarousal. So people become very uh, easily startled uh, if there's, a, uh, for example, noises, or in this case, if there's a news of an epidemic or, or something uh, that might not reach the point of a, of a pandemic, but people who develop PTSD uh, would end up having the same response when they hear, as soon as they hear something about some kind of infectious disease. Uh, so that would be PTSD. Uh, the most common symptoms that people would, uh, would uh, end up developing would be uh, sleep, uh, changes, uh, anxiety, uh, feeling sad, and bereavement, right? that, that which most of us are, are struggling with, if it's not all of us. So uh, with COVID, what, um, based on what we know from disaster psychiatry, um, uh, it, it seems like there's going to be a second wave here of people being affected. And I'm not talking about the infection itself, but the infection is going to have its own life. Uh, and, and of course, there's infectious disease doctors who would be better qualified of talking about that than, than I would uh, be. But I'm talking about the mental health um, um, uh, effects that this is going to have on people, right? And I would say that that's going to be a separate pandemic because, again, it's going to affect the whole world. It's not just us. And I don't think the world is prepared for this. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, it, we're pretty, uh, we don't have enough psychiatrists. Uh, in, in the state, and actually I will say in the whole country, uh, or I haven't heard of a single country that would have enough psychiatric beds available uh, for people. Uh, so psychiatry tends to be a pretty underserved uh, population. Um, it's likely uh, going to increase uh, the number of deaths by suicide and overdose. Um, and it's likely that the, that the groups of people who are going to be affected the most are the groups of people who uh, the infection itself is affecting the most, right? The Latino population, the African Americans, and lower socioeconomic uh, groups. In the case of infections, it might be because of reasons such as, uh, as they live in tight spaces, right? So there's not much of a 
social distancing, right, um, and education and things like that. Uh, and in the case of, uh, of uh, suicide and psychiatric um, uh, illnesses, uh, is it, likely due to um, not being able to have psychiatric, receive psychiatric care, uh, afford medications, afford therapy, right? And not only afford therapy based on finances, but also afford therapy based on the ability to take the time to go to therapy once a week or, or, or more, even more than that. So uh, based again on what we know from disaster psychiatry, uh, the highest risk for suicide occurs approximately six months from the, the time of the event. Uh, so basically it will be now, right? Anywhere, what, what, they are, um, what they're hypothesizing is that anywhere between October and December 2020 is when we are likely to see the highest risk for suicide uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and the, there's a research that shows that for every percentage of unemployment rate uh, that goes up, there's a 1.6% of uh, increased suicide rate, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, pretty uh, concerning, right, given, the, uh, given our current state. Um, so in Washington state, there's uh, uh, more than 1,200 people who die by suicide per year. Um, which means that if unemployment increases by 5% in the state, that's going to be more than 100 people extra that are going to die by suicide this year. And if it, uh, uh, unemployment goes uh, by 20%, uh, it will be more than 400 people who will die by suicide this year extra to the 1,200. So it's going to be about 1,600, 1,700 people uh, who will die by suicide in the state of Washington um, based on the unemployment, right? Now, then we have to add... Uh, all the other effects that the pandemic is having with the depression, the anxiety, um, and, and, and all the stuff. So about, and, and this is in general, it's just not, not with the pandemia, um, about half of the people who develop a mental health uh, illness would also develop a substance use disorder and vice versa, right? And we, um, you know, we always hear about people who, who say, well, I'm, I'm drinking or I'm using substances uh, as a way of self-treatment right, for, for the substance use. Um, yeah, that's accurate. Uh, it, it's, it's possible that, that that's how people start and that's how people cope. But then at the end of the day, they do develop a separate illness, uh, which is a comorbid disorder and a co-occurring disorder with the, with, the, um, with the mental health. And now there's two illnesses to treat, right? So. When that happens, regardless, even if it's something that they develop as a coping skill for to treat their depression, their anxiety, or any kind of psychiatric illness, it still develop it, it turns into an illness of itself, and it still needs treatment for for that illness as well. And and the same thing with uh, uh, somebody, even if they don't have any any mental health problems and they start using substances, about 50% of those people. Uh, will develop a mental health disorder later on, and the same thing, right? We need to treat both things. So as providers, as a psychiatrist or therapist, uh, or any mental health providers, um, uh, we need to be focusing on how we can uh, support the social connections in the community, right? So when people are depressed, they, one of the ways that depression and anxiety plays uh, tricks in our brains is that they it makes us feel like we don't want to we don't want to be around people we want to isolate we want to be left alone um, we don't want to exercise uh, we don't feel like cooking so we eat pizza uh, and all this other stuff right and then the more we isolate the less we exercise uh, the more unhealthy food we we uh, uh, eat the more time we spend in uh, watching TV and not going to bed on time the more depressed we get, right? So we don't feel like doing it uh, because of the depression. We end up not doing what we need to do. We get more depressed and it becomes a vicious circle, right? Um, and that's something we, that as providers we need to be focusing on, right? Trying to stop that vicious circle. Now it's tricky because we also can't, uh, we can't be encouraging people to do things that might be dangerous to, to their health, their physical health, right? Like asking them to, uh, to just go out and be, uh, be hanging out with people or, or being out in, the, in, in, in places where they could potentially catch the virus. Right? So we need to be a little more uh, uh, mindful of that 
and and a little more creative and, and maybe helping them connect with others via you know just like we're doing right now uh via video uh, uh or uh with with uh, safe distances um, we also need to be uh, helping people develop coping skills to to deal with the stressors right like uh, again with exercise um, healthy coping skills reading or any other kind of activities that people can get engaged in We also need to be educating people regarding the potential symptoms to look for in case that they, they start um, uh, developing any kind of uh, uh, psychiatric illness symptoms. So, th so this is a graph that, that, I, that I got from um, uh, Washington State's report. And this is what, and, and this is again based on the, the studies that are, uh, that come out of the disaster psychiatry community. Uh, this is what they expect to see um, uh, as we go along with the pandemia, right? So pre-disaster, right, we were hearing the, about the news uh, first from, from Asia, right? And then we heard about the news that all of us are in Italy, there were cases, and in France, there were cases, in all the places there were cases, uh, Italy closing its, uh, uh, the whole, basically the whole country, right? Uh, we were hearing about all those people dying. Um, and, and I think most of us knew that was just a matter of time. It, it, was, it was gonna happen to us, right? Uh, and the, so that's the pre-disaster, right? And then we, the threat, right? We all of a sudden is closer to us, right? Like it feels like Europe is going to be much closer to to arrive here compared to to Asia. Then we got the hit, right? We got the impact. Uh, then we we get together as a community. That's the hero the heroic part. Uh, then we uh, that's the honeymoon part, right? We feel like okay, we can have a handle of this. We're we're tackling this. We're doing well. And then it gets to the point that I, what I think we are in right now of like everything that we're doing and we still have all this debt, all these cases, all these hospitalizations, uh, and there's the, the solution part, right? And that's the dangerous part. That's, that's when we start seeing the, the, the suicides. Uh, that's the six months after the event. Uh, for up to a year. Then at the time of the anniversary, uh, like it happens with a lot of other stressors, for example, the death of a parent or a spouse or something, on the anniversary, it's always gonna be a hard time for, uh, for people who, who got affected uh, with depression or anxiety. And that uh, increases the risk of suicide as well uh, during those days. And then there's gonna be the gradual uh, recovery. Like in any psychiatric illness, the recovery is not a straight line. There's gonna be its peaks and, and, peaks and valleys, right? So the, you know, the best coping skills that we can, uh, that we can focus on right now is being resilient, right? Um, focusing on developing those uh, social connections, uh, a sense of purpose, right? That's something that we all strive for in, in life, right? That's our, our main, uh, you know, when we, when we ask about what the you know, life, right? We actually asking what's the purpose? What's the, where's the sense of purpose? Uh, we need to be psychologically flexible and be focusing on the hope, right? What can we do to progress, right? To get better. And as psychiatrists and therapists, we, we need to be working on that with our, uh, with, our, with our patients. So what are some concerns right now uh, uh, with people? Uh, obviously, people are very concerned about contracting the illness or how, well, some people have contracted the illness and they're concerned about recuperating. Um, the isolation, right? So that's the biggest thing, right? Uh, uh, isolating from family, friends, uh, prolonged grief, right? Because this is a, if we all think about it, we've been grieving now since the beginning of the year, right? And, and this is gonna be going on for even longer, right? Unemployment, or even if we're employed, uh, um, you know, working from home, uh, things are different, right? From what we used to, uh, financial stressors to a lot of people, um, uh, school for kids for, actually what I'm seeing a lot is, uh, College age kids, right, who um, have been working on their applications, having 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 this uh, uh, this hopes, right, this dream of going to college and going to those universities, and all of a sudden they're back at home with their parents, right. This is not exactly what they were what they were hoping for, um, or even if, it, if the school opened, they're there at school, right, but they, there's a lot of restrictions, which is really very different from what they had envisioned. Um, the lack of routines and lack of exercising, I think, is a lot affecting a lot of people as well. And and I will talk in a moment about what I'm seeing here uh, at Overlake 
uh, with this particular symptoms uh, and, and what people are reporting. So with any, with any stressor, we, we get, uh, there's some physical response symptoms that we get, some emotional response symptoms that we get um, um, that I'll, I'll go over briefly. Uh, that are like a, um, most people end up having this kind of symptoms, right? But there's also going to be people who are outliers and they might affect them uh, differently. So physical response. So with anxiety, um, in general, we get kind of short of breath, right? We, we, we our, our breathing becomes a little more shallow when we're anxious, um, uh, which uh, increases our heart rate. Uh, we, we might get uh, sweaty, uh, dizzy. Uh, our blood pressure might go up. Uh, some people um, uh, develop like migraine headaches and, and a little bit of shakes. Uh, the, the, the stomach is upset, right? And when, when we're very depressed, when we're very anxious, we start feeling all these pains and aches, right? And, and this is something that everybody with anxiety and depression ends up struggling with. We end up feeling pain you know, and, and discomfort uh, way much more than what we would have felt without the depression. And there's a lot of studies that show that um, people with chronic pain uh, who are struggling with depression as well, we treat their depression, their anxiety, and yes, they still have chronic pain because it's a real illness, but the reported pain is, uh, is lower than, than what it was when they were struggling with depression and anxiety. So mental responses. Uh, you, you start getting hypervigilant um, uh, when, when you're very anxious. Uh, you may get some unpleasant, uh, disturbing, intrusive images. Uh, you might develop nightmares, and it's not related to PTSD. It um, doesn't have to be related to PTSD. It's just nightmares in general, right? We, we're kind of uh, restless, and, and, and we start getting all these unpleasant dreams. Uh, memory problems, which in, in reality is not really memory problems. It's more problems with concentration uh, that a lot of people report as memory issues. Uh, and at least uh, there's, again, the poor concentration there and, and feeling confused. A lot of people at the beginning of the uh, the first couple of months, you know, they, you didn't even know which month it was, which day it was, uh, especially because it, it, if people were not going to work or, or had lost the routines that they had been engaged in. Uh, emotional response, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, the denial. Right? Whenever there's some kind of grieving, uh, there's going to be that part uh, that we start denying things. Uh, we might get uh, agitated. Uh, we might get very angry about the events. Um, uh, we we have a lot of fear. Uh, we start grieving, and, and we just feel overwhelmed. And with anybody struggling with depression or anxiety, um, there's going to be event, uh, episodes when we feel very irritable. Right? Small things uh, makes us makes us snap uh, when they're getting used to. So behavioral response, uh, changing patterns. Um, uh, so you're not going to be acting like yourself, or we haven't been acting like ourselves, um, most of us. Um, uh, a lot of people might struggle with increased uh, substance use, not just alcohol, but just substances in general. Uh, it's going to affect our functions, our, our bodily functions, including sexual function. Um, uh, some people, again, get very irritable. They might, get a, uh, they might start getting in, into outbursts. Uh, we get social, socially withdrawn, again, like I said earlier, and this is not just because of the social isolation, but also because of the anxiety and depression that um, uh, people tend to, to isolate more when they're going through, uh, through anxiety and depression. So um, I, I put in he, this in here in the, in the stock uh, based on some questions that I, uh, that I uh, received. And this is um, based on uh, the report from the um, from Washington State, just about it. Uh, what can the families do? What can people do to help um, uh, to help their loved ones during this period of time? So there are some things that are going to be in common with all of it. So I'm going to talk about families in general, about uh, 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 toddlers. How can we can we be there, be there for toddlers? About um, adolescents and about um, um, adult family members and caregivers. Um, and there are some of the uh, some things that are there that, that that all of those share in common. Um, one of those is going to be being predictable and consistent with um, routines, right? Trying to keep the routine, uh, the sleep routine, the uh, the eating habits, exercise, and trying to interact as much as possible, even even if it's uh, socially distanced, 
um, trying to interact with people. So uh, this slide is for caregivers, uh, and like I said, uh, um, the meals, right? And this is going to be uh, for all of the, again, for toddlers, for adolescents, for, for kids, for caregivers, uh, having uh, regular healthy meals, uh, sleep schedule, uh, keeping a sleep schedule, even if we don't need to be going, waking up or to go to work or go to meetings or anything, trying to keep that sleep schedule is going to be very important. Um, Avoiding screens, this is something that is the, uh, um, one of the pillars of uh, uh, healthy uh, sleeping habits is try not to have any screen time uh, within an hour from, from, uh, from when you go to bed. And that includes tablets and computers. Um, exercising when, when able to exercise, uh, you know, that's going to be one of the best outlets, right, of, uh, of anxiety and, um, and, and all that energy that we have. That we're not really utilizing by going to work when, when if people are staying at home. Uh, it, trying to find ways to uh, stay connected with people, like now again with a uh, with video. Um, if you're somebody who uh, tends to um, participate in spiritual uh, events, uh, keeping yourself engaged in in that spirit religion or spiritual event that you get engaged with, uh, still offering the support and receiving support from friends and family, right? Uh, I think it's very easy, well, it's not easy, it's very common that we we offer support to people, we, we want to be there with people, uh, for people. Uh, uh, we want for people to call us when they need something. Uh, we want to be in the speed dial for people, right, and be there. But we're not good at actually reaching out, right, and, and asking for help ourselves. And, and again, like I said earlier, this is uh, it's terrible that we all go on through this, but the good thing is that we all go on through this and everybody understands where we're coming from when we talk about the stressors that we're having with the pandemic. Uh, so reaching out is going to be very important uh, and people are going to understand. Uh, so infants, uh, toddlers, again, nourishing meals, uh, keeping a uh, keeping a schedule with a with the uh, sleep wake cycle, um, keeping your your closeness with kids, uh, trying to um, trying to have uh, one on one time with each of the kids. If you have more, if you have many kids, uh, or even at home, right, with, with spouse or, uh, or or roommates or or whatever the living arrangement it is, trying to have one on one. Uh, time with people is, is also very important. Um, very similar for school age uh, children, uh, meals, keeping the uh, uh, sleep uh, uh, cycle, uh, exercising, uh, trying to stay as socially connected as we can, um, the spiritual practices. Um, limits are still going to be, are, are going to be very important, right? We're trying to be uh, um, trying to be a little more gentle uh, with the with the uh, limit setting, and I know I'm a I'm a dad of a, a small kids. I know that is hard, but trying to do that is going to be essential. Um, with our adolescents, same thing: meals, sleep wake cycle. Again, there's there's a pattern here of what is what is healthy, right? And it's pretty much keeping our routines and keeping a you know, healthy routines, right? With, with healthy meals, uh, with uh, exercise, keeping yourself socially connected with people, even if it means that it's on the phone or via video. Um, but we all need those uh, social interactions. Um, the uh, something else that I think is very important, and, so, and I think a lot of people have. Uh, questions about, so about what do we do with the kids, with teenagers? Is this something we talk about? Are, are we going to be stressing them out if we're talking about this? Um, I think it's very important for for kids and, and teenagers to know what's going on. Now, we don't want to make it uh, um, we don't want to make it stressful for them, right? We want to let them know what's happening. Um, but uh, we also want to reassure them and let them know that we're doing everything we can to go through it, right, and and, and be safe, right. Um, and that goes with the limits as well, right. As a as a dad of small kids, right, uh, something 
uh, that um, uh, that comes uh, comes out all the time is they want to have play dates, right? And we have our little neighbors who are the same age as my kids, and they want to have play dates. So there's sleepovers, just like it was uh, prior to this, right? So trying to explain to them, like you know, I know it's, this is very difficult, uh, and it's been it's unfortunately been difficult for everybody here, but we're making this decision based on your safety because we love you, and we just want you to be safe. We want everybody to be safe, and as soon as this is done, we are going to get back to that. But for right now, it's going to be a, a period of time in which we're going to have to keep it safe. Um, and, and, you know, setting those limits. I know it's very hard, but we're going to have to do that, right? Um, so, again, not hiding things from, from the kids, but also not, uh, not making it to the point that they're going to be feeling overwhelmed and, and, and scared. Um, but my next slide is just about questions. But before doing that, I want to uh, talk about what I'm seeing here at Overlake and what we are doing here to help during the pandemic. So uh, some of you know, I'm, uh, my work here at Overlake is as the inpatient psychiatrist. So, so people who are being hospitalized in the unit, right? And people get hospitalized for multiple reasons, suicide attempts, uh, anxiety to the point that they can't function, um, psychosis, like hearing voices or being being paranoid, people who are manic. So something that has been, uh, that people have had in common uh, during their hospitalizations here is that whenever I ask them, what are your main stressors at the moment? Everybody, COVID, right? Um, either uh, uh, COVID and I can't see my friends, COVID and I can't travel, COVID and I can't work, uh, I lost my job, I was furloughed. Um, the the you know my hours are cut. Uh, my uh, my work used to used to be my outing for the day and used to be where I used to socialize. And now I don't have that. Uh, so COVID and everything else that has been the you know stressor for every single person that I hospitalized um, in the unit since this whole thing began. Um, there's been we at the beginning of the uh, uh, of COVID here, um, March, right? Um, people were not going out at all, right? Including not coming to hospitals. Uh, so I think the hospital, the 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 unit, uh, the census for the unit at that point dropped because people were avoiding coming to the unit, uh, coming to hospitals. But since then, it's been very busy, and I definitely have seen. Uh, an uptake on depression, anxiety, uh, anxiety disorders, including uh, what is called acute stress disorder, which is like a, um, it's a step behind PTSD. A lot of people who develop what is called acute stress disorder develop PTSD later on. Uh, and a lot of substance use disorders. Um, and not just alcohol, right? marijuana use, uh, opiate use, um, methamphetamine use, a lot of substance use disorders. Uh, that we're seeing. And, and again, many of those people uh, say that, um, uh, yeah, they have been struggling with substances before, but since COVID hit, the use went through the roof. Right? They, they, they really use it more than what they used to. Um, some of the challenges that we're seeing, and, and this is where uh, what we are doing here at Overly comes to play, is that a lot of the practices, uh, uh, including um, uh, psychiatrists who are uh, private practice providers, uh, other programs that offer, uh, for, uh, for example, group therapy like partial hospital program or day treatment, um, some chemical dependency programs, a lot of them have gone virtual, right? Um, and I understand why they would do it, uh, but that has left uh, in-person options off the table for a lot of people who say they would benefit more from in-person treatment. So what we have done here at Overlake is that, yes, we do have the technology to do virtual so telemedicine, and I think Overlake did a great job uh, adapting telemedicine very quickly when the pandemic hit, um, and that has been great for a lot of patients, but there are a lot of patients who actually want to come to the clinic, want to see somebody in person, and we have been able to keep that when there's many other places that have not been able to do that, um, and that has been a savior for a lot of patients. So some of the challenges for the patients when, I, when I'm discharging them from the unit 
is that unfortunately many of them because of where they live or 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 their um the kind of treatment that they need they might not be able to come to overlay and they're going to go to uh an old place that might be virtual right and and a lot of them uh you know really would rather do something that is more in person um so again something that i think that we're doing really well here is having that flexibility of being able to do both things um there's a there's something that's called partial hospital programming, which I'm not sure if everybody is aware of what that means. So part just briefly, partial hospital is a program in which people when people are not doing well, but they don't meet criteria to be in a hospital per se, um, but they're also not doing well enough to be able to function normally. They go to this program that runs from anywhere from seven days to two weeks, in which they they go on a Monday to Friday basis. Uh, from 8.30 in the morning until 2.30 p.m. They have group therapy. They see a psychiatrist there on a daily basis. Um, so it's kind of like a step down from, from being patient, from being hospitalized. Um, so some of those programs actually went virtual as well. And it's kind of hard to stay, you know, kind of six hours on the computer, uh, seven to 14 days, right, doing the group therapy. So we were able to keep that open uh, in person as well, uh, and we've been able to keep the staff um, to be able to be running that program. Uh, because of the of, uh, regulations and the size of the room, uh, we can only take up to five patients right now because we need to have those six feet uh, in between the patients. Um, but we are working on, uh, with the Department of Health, on trying to there's a throw down a wall at the clinic and making that room bigger because there's two rooms that are next to each other and we'll be able to do that, but it takes some time and the Department of Health needs to license us to be able to do it and we are in the process of doing that to be able to to increase the volume of patients we're gonna be seeing in the partial hospital programming. Um, we were able to, to keep the clinic open uh, with, again, with telemedicine and, um, and in-person visits. And the other thing that has been very helpful is our integrative psychiatry program. And what that means is that we have a psychiatrist. Uh, her name is Danielle Ivanova. And she uh, is uh, seeing patients at two of our primary care clinics. Um, one of them is here at the Pavilion in, in, in Bellevue. Uh, the other clinics in Redmond. Uh, and in Redmond, she sees patients from Kirkland and Redmond. Uh, and what that means is that patients who are being seen by the primary care providers at those clinics, if they're going through some kind of mental health crisis, or if they need some kind of uh, um, mental health evaluation, they can refer the patient to her. And Dr. Ivanova works with that patient to start the treatment, uh, get them in the right track, and then the patients go back to the primary care provider to continue with the treatment. Unless Dr. Ivanova believes that the patient will benefit from a long-term psychiatrist, then she will refer those patients to the um, to the psychiatric clinic um, uh, for them to continue working uh, with, with the psychiatrist. So that has been very helpful right now as well during COVID because again, we've seen a lot, a lot more anxiety disorders, a lot more depression, and that has opened the doors for the patients to be able to be seen quite quickly. Uh, many of those patients uh, see their primary care doctor and they have an appointment with Dr. Ivanova the following day. So they're able to be seen quite quickly and, and receive psychiatric care. Uh, so that's another great thing that I, that I think we're doing here at Overlay. And um, again, we also um, uh, started this year uh, our dual diagnosis track in the in the unit. And with the increase of substance use disorders uh, that we're seeing, we're able to provide a service that before we're not was not able to be provided uh, for these patients. So uh, uh, so I'm very excited about what we're doing here at Overlake, and we're um, always uh, trying to work at improving adding more services uh, for, for our community. Uh, our goal uh, is to be able to treat anybody from our community for any kind of psychiatric care, uh, and, and that's what we're working towards uh, in the psychiatry department. So for now, we'd like to open it to, to any kind of questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Avila. Uh, really, really helpful, um, great, great, Great comments and, and um, good information for all of us. And you touched on so many of the questions that came in 
uh, prior to the program, and so that, that was very, very helpful. It does look like we're, we're, we have one that's come in through, a question that's come in through chat. Mike, I want to thank you also. And before we get to the questions, is there anything else you want to add before we open up for the general uh, Q&A? I, I don't have anything else to add, Molly. Go ahead and let's open it up. Okay, sure. The, first, uh, the question that's come through, um, and this would be definitely for you, for Dr. Avila, given the associated suicide risk with unemployment, as well as the positive evidence for behavioral activation, what is Overlake's perspective on the Barrington Declaration, specifically endorsing focus protection? The Barrington Declaration? I, I might need to have a little more information for me to be able to answer that question. Okay. And maybe we'll take that offline uh, and get that answer back to you, Lisa. Um, it seems that might be the best way to do, do that. Um, any, uh, Kate Greenquist has her hand up. You can unmute Kate and ask your question. Oh, okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, okay, um, when do you expect the new unit to open? And I understand that will be bigger. And so does that mean you'll have additional services available for people? So uh, the new unit, I believe, is going to open in, uh, Mike, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is it 2021, at the end of 2021? Uh, yeah, it'll be uh, end of October in 2021. And about, the, thank you, Mike, and, and about the, um, the size, the size is going to be bigger. The number of beds for right now is still going to be at 14. So we're going to open at 14 beds. Um, I believe that we, or I know that Overlake is licensed to 34 beds. My hope, my goal, and I know that the, the organization wants this as well, is at some point to be able to reach those 34 beds, but it's going to be a process, right? And, and I don't know when will we be opening more beds. Uh, Kate, yes. Mike, Kate, just to add to uh, what Dr. Avila mentioned, uh, you know, we just this year, um, because of the relationship between addiction and um, other mental health conditions, um, we expanded our unit's capacity to care for people with co-occurring disorders. And so that occurred this year, but it will flow over into the new unit. And as Dr. Avila said, the new unit will be considerably larger with much uh, more, uh, with more generous treatment space that will give us options to provide um, more suitable um, healing environments uh, for our uh, psychiatric patients. Our patients get great care in the in uh, the leadership that Dr. Avila and his team provide, but um, this the setting uh, leaves something to be desired. And this this new facility will be really quite inviting and really healing in terms of the amenities that it presents to the patients. Okay, there's another question, uh, and this probably also is one for the both of you. Um, the question is, would you focus also on involuntary geropsych? There is a large lack of beds in King County. Mike, this may be one you want to take first. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to. So our program, um, we have, for, for those of you that may or may not be aware, uh, psychiatric patients are oftentimes uh, uh, designated in two different categories, voluntary or involuntary. Our current program is a voluntary unit. So uh, while we do have something called single bed certifications, which can manage involuntary patients that come to us through the ED, uh, we don't care for on a longer term basis involuntary patients. So. All of our patients are here on their own volition and um, because they 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 want to be here and they want to have their their illness treated. Um, so we don't have for the foreseeable future any desire. Um, uh, there is a need. Uh, desire is the wrong word, but we don't have any plans to um, expand our offerings to involuntary patients, both our 
adult or gero psych patients. However, uh, your point about gero psych, um, I would, I guess I would say that there is also a very large and growing need for gero psych care, whether it be voluntary or involuntary. And that, as Dr. Avila said, that is actually one of the highest um, value opportunities that we see in the nearer term as it relates to this larger facility that has the capacity to flex up to 34 beds. So I do think Juro Psych will be in our future, but it will likely be um, specialized Juro Psych, but it will likely be um, voluntary, not involuntary. Yeah, and, and, and just uh, my take is uh, ultimately I would like for us to be able to treat anybody who is 18 and older. Uh, of course, right now, in about voluntary versus involuntary, is something related to um, legally, right? We we just not credential for involuntary beds right now. Um, but regarding geo psych, my goal would be if you have a psychiatric illness, or you any of your loved ones have a psychiatric illness, and you're 18 or older or older, I would like to be able to offer you any kind of help uh, for psychiatric illnesses. Um, and I say 18 and older uh, because we don't have peds here, pediatrics in the in the hospital, and I don't think it will be safe for us to be getting child psychiatry uh, patients without the assistance of, of pediatrics. We do have geriatric uh, providers uh, who work uh, at Overlake because we have the senior center, so that will be uh, great for us to have that and help us in the process of seeing geriatric psychiatric patients. Okay, there's another question that um, is, uh, Dr. Avila, you could probably uh, handle this very, very well. Are we getting referrals from outside the east side since others are not doing in-person services? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, we, a lot of patients we get from Seattle. Um, some of you may know, but uh, the University of Washington closed uh, their unit. Um, I don't know, maybe a month and a half ago or two months ago. Um, so we get a lot of patients from the University of Washington. Um, and we get patients from all over the area, right, from, from Spokane, from a lot of places in the state. Interesting. Any more? It looks like Kate has her hand up. Oh, Kate. Kate always Kate. has a lot of questions. Um, Dr. Avila, are you using um, meditation in your practice with the inpatients? And do you find that it's um, particularly effective with COVID, even for individuals? Uh, I'm sorry, you mentioned, you said med meditation? Meditation, yeah, not not medication, meditation. Yeah. You mentioned yeah, that, meditation. That, you had, that you were oriented to meditation. Yeah. So um, yeah, so meditation. There's uh, we have uh, so in the unit is when somebody gets hospitalized, they have groups the whole day, right? So people are in the unit. Uh, they see me as a psychiatrist, and I do the medication management. Um, but they have groups with a with a mental health specialist the whole day, and in those groups uh, uh, there's some meditation included, and there's some other kind of therapy, the cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal kind of therapy as well included. As a group setting, so we are doing some meditation in the in the uh, inpatient setting. It's not me who is doing it; it's a mental health specialist. So my role in the inpatient setting will be more doing medication management and, and guiding a little bit uh, towards. Uh, if, our, for example, if we believe that a particular patient needs a kind of therapy that is called dialectical behavioral therapy, right? So guiding a little more of the patient towards that, and 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 helping coordinate with the social worker to get the appropriate resources for, for that kind of therapy. Do you see meditation as valuable for for dealing at for an average person dealing with COVID like at home? Yes. So the very depending on the severity of the illness, uh, of the symptoms, um, medications might be warranted. And for the most part, for people who are hospitalized, their illness got to the point that the severity might warrant medication management. And, and the medication, so so in, in psychiatry with depression or any psychiatric illness, uh, well, depression and anxiety, I wouldn't say with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but let's say depression and anxiety, the main treatment is always going to be psychotherapy. 
right? That's, what, that's what's going to help with the coping skills, uh, uh, help people uh, go through all the stressors. But medications are going to help with, this, with some of the symptoms. Like, for example, uh, the symptoms of depression include that people might be either sleeping too much, sleeping too little. Medications are going to help with that. It's going to help with the concentration as well, which gets affected uh, when people are depressed or anxious. Uh, it's going to help with their appetite as well, which might get affected uh, when people are depressed and anxious. And it's going to help with a, uh, with a little bit of motivation. People, when they're, when they're very depressed or anxious, um, they lack the motivation uh, to get going. Like I said earlier, there's that virtuous circle that you're depressed, so you don't want to exercise, or you don't want to, or you don't want to be around people, um, and then it becomes that virtuous circle. Medications are going to help with that kind of motivation. That's great. It looks like we're out of questions and we're almost out of time, so that worked pretty well. Um, this has been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Avila. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, all of you. We are here to provide information and, and um, assistance in anything you need. You are our donors and our friends. You've helped us. Uh, be able to be the great hospital that we are. I think all of us appreciate it over Lake even more so over this past year. And um, we at this point just want to thank you for helping us to be, to giving us the support we need to continue to do what we like to do, which is to provide world-class care to all of you. If there are any particular questions about our program or anything else, please email us at events at overlakehospital.org and we'll try to get you an answer. Um, there is a copy of the deck for anyone who would like it. Please email at the same email and we will get you that deck. Um, in a few, um, we'll be sending you a survey quite shortly. Um, we wanna hear from you what other, you know, what you liked about this program and what other topics you would like to hear more about uh, going forward. Uh, so please, please uh, help us make sure that we can provide you the information that's most useful and um, interesting to you. Um, in the uh, in event, in a, maybe probably by the end of the week, if not sooner, we will actually send a link to all of you to the video version of, of today's program. Feel free to share it. There's great content, as you heard. We all need to be reminded about taking our, you know, doing the simple things that we can do to stay, to stay healthy. So thanks again to everybody and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thank you.